We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to begin with tonight. It's good to see those who are here. Uh, it's good to see some who have not been here for a while. Caleb's still with us tonight, and it's good to see him. Almost didn't recognize who he was. Caleb, good to have you with us. Good to have everyone here. Our lesson tonight is entitled, The Resurrection of the Dead. I ran off and left my good glasses at home on the dresser, so I've got these readers, which is going to be the read a while and look at you a while, so just bear with me for tonight. Hopefully we'll get through without too much distraction. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 35, the question is asked, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they appear? That's the question we want to try to answer tonight. With what body do they appear? Some people talk of resurrection and really don't believe it. They think that the body has nothing to do with the resurrection of the dead. Which is rather ironic. I met a preacher years ago who took that position. And I couldn't believe that he believed that because I've never heard that before. But that is the question being raised. And so we want to... Say, I believe the resurrection, but what do we know about the resurrection? So this lesson is designed to talk about that and to hopefully uh, answer any questions you might have on the subject to the best of our ability. Jesus' resurrection is about the only thing we really know much about. We know others were raised, but very little is said about them. For example, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, wouldn't you like to go up to Lazarus and say, well now, what was it like to be dead? Do you remember what it was like? And we wouldn't know what to expect today because the Bible doesn't deal with that. But we do see the resurrection of Jesus and we see that it includes his body and most of what I'm going to show tonight kind of proves that point. And so we need to understand that if you have a question about it, feel free to let me know. First of all, it says that Jesus' body is like our own. We will one day in Philippians 3.21 be conformed to his glorious body. And so the body which Jesus has now in heaven is a glorious body, and we need to understand that beyond anything else. It is our lowly body that we have now, our present body. Uh, Thayer's in his Greek-English dictionary says, the body of our low estate. And so our physical body, our present body, is also called a vile or lowly body, and it is going to be changed not exchanged for another so keep that word in mind it will be changed the very vile body itself will be changed not exchanged for some something entirely different Uh, also it will be according to his glorious body well his earthly body was not in the glorified state we go back to john chapter 1 and verse 1 it says Uh, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in verse 14 it says, the Word became what? Flesh. Flesh. And we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father. So the body Jesus had is a body just exactly like ours. Hebrews 10.5 has the writer saying, quoting the Old Testament, a body you have prepared for me. In Hebrews 2, 16 and 17, it says, He was in all things made like unto His brethren. So, His body is like our body, and those things are identical, and that's pretty interesting. Hebrews 4, 15, uh, we can come boldly to the throne of grace because we have a high priest who can sympathize with our infirmities. And if we wanted to add to the list, we could say in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, that there it says, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus had a body like ours, and when he died, he died just like you and I die. And when he was raised from the dead, he's raised just like one day you and I will be raised. So that's pretty fascinating to see how that works and to talk about that a little bit more. In John 7, 39, we learn that his body was not yet in its glorified state. There the text simply says, 
but Jesus Christ was not in his glorified state. Chapter 7, verse 39. He entered into his glory after his resurrection. We know that because in Luke chapter 22, verse 26, Jesus asked the disciples, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And so in 1 John 1 and, 1 and 2, Jesus manifested his eternal life to them. And so the apostles saw the resurrected Lord may have seen the glorified Lord, but in Revelation 1.18 it said, He was alive forevermore. And so He appeared to the twelve and Cephas and Paul and exhibited that eternal life. We know that life is the body and the spirit united. So eternal life involves an eternal body with the spirit and it lives forever. And that's how we understand the resurrection. If you think of the resurrection as something different from that, then uh, you'd be mistaken about it. In John 2, 19 through 21, Jesus answered and said to his opponents, Destroy this what? Temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Not just my spirit, not another body, but the same one. Destroy this body, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But John writes and says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. And so was Jesus clothed with the same body after his resurrection? And the answer is yes, because if it was not, why was this thought in the mind of the apostles? They remembered after his resurrection that he had said this thing. And so another body would not have been a resurrection. And if you wonder who takes that position, the Jehovah's Witnesses are one group because they say when you die, you're dead completely, you cease to exist. But then they talk about a resurrection, but the resurrection they're talking about is simply a reuniting of a bunch of molecules that look like you. Because they don't believe we have an eternal spirit, so when the body dies, you cease to exist. So be careful when you're talking to them. They'll say resurrection, but they don't mean the same thing you and I do by that. And you remember in Luke 24, 39, when the disciples were questioning the resurrection of Jesus, he said, Behold my hands and my feet. He had nail scars and he had a spear pierced side, so it's the exact same body, but it's alive again. It's not glorified yet, but it is certainly a body that was raised from the dead never to die again. And then back in 1 Corinthians 15, 44, it says, It is sown a natural body, talking about our death. When we die, we bury the physical body. It's sown a natural body, but it is raised what? A spiritual body. What do we mean by a spiritual body? Well, I don't know the exact description except to say a spiritual body is a body designed for eternal life. A body that can live in heaven. And so that is how it is raised. And Paul says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Again, Jesus is our only example of a spiritual body, but that body is suited for heaven. It is immortal or deathless, and that was the difference between Jesus' resurrection and all prior resurrections. He resurrected from the dead, never to die again. But his body was changed from a natural body to a spiritual body in his resurrection as well. Well, was Jesus raised? Turn to Acts chapter 2 with me, if you would. And let's notice carefully the terminology that the Apostles used in describing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think it's pretty fascinating. I've always enjoyed looking at this chapter. But in Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> going down to verse 23, it says, Jesus being delivered by the determined counsel or purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken him by wicked hands, have crucified and put to death. I think some translations say have crucified and slain. But you see his body was put to death. Okay, so that's what we have that was killed. But then in verse 24 it said, Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So the body is put to death, but God loosed the pains of death, which means the body came back to life. And then in describing and proving this point, he quotes the psalmist David in verse 26, he said, Therefore my heart rejoiced, my tongue was glad, moreover my what? 
flesh will rest in hope. My flesh will, for you will not leave my soul, the eternal part of man, in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And so if the flesh were not involved, then you wouldn't even be talking about corruption. But you see what happened. Jesus died. His body went into the tomb. His spirit went into the Hadean realm. You remember on the cross, he told one of the thieves, Today you shall be with me where? In paradise. paradise. That is the heavenly realm where the disembodied spirit goes until the resurrection. We read about that in Luke 16 when the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man goes to torment and Lazarus goes to what is there called Abraham's bosom, which is the same as as paradise. And there's a gulf between the two so you can't go from one to the other back and forth. So that being the case, he said, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not allow it to see corruption. Three or four days after our death, our body's going to begin to corrupt. It's going to begin to decay. And he said, you would not leave my soul in Hades. While he was with the um, thief on the cross in paradise, where the thief stayed, Jesus came back to the earth. So you see what the resurrection is, don't you? The reuniting of the eternal spirit with the physical body. And that's what they're arguing for here. And then he explains in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me speak to you of the patriarch David, that he is dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In other words, David's not talking about himself. He's speaking as though it's himself, but he's speaking of his descendant, the Christ, the one born of the flesh after David. So he says, Therefore, verse 30, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to what? The flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. And so again, God swore to David that he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, but he did that according to the flesh. Christ is going to be raised from the dead, never to die again. His spirit is going to be reunited with his body, and he would ascend to heaven where he's there in his glorified state at the right hand of God as King of kings and Lord of lords. So you see, that's what's saying, being said here. And you say, well, I knew that already. Well, you didn't until the Bible told you. If you knew it already, it's because you studied it already. And this is the first time this sermon is preached on the day of Pentecost. And the Jews probably did not have a clear conception of the resurrection, either of Jesus or of ourselves. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, <clears throat> when John saw the vision, he saw the Christ and he said, I beheld one as a lamb that had been slain. And so this lamb that had been slain is Jesus Christ because of his crucifixion. Well, another interesting point is simply this. In Acts, well, we got the rest. I've already done this part. This Jesus has God raised up, verse 32. What Jesus? Well, the same Jesus that you crucified, verse 36. And so again... He was the lamb as though he had been slain, but he was the same Jesus that was killed, and God raised him up. So again, it makes it clear, I think. 1 John 3 and verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we see him, we shall be what? Like Like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now there's that resurrected, glorified body that we've not yet seen, Jesus resurrected and he showed that resurrected body to his disciples. But when it ascended to heaven, it became a glorified body, which is something greater than what uh, we ourselves have right now or even will have uh, at the beginning of our resurrection. But we shall be like him. So there's a lot of things we don't know and haven't been told about a spiritual and mortal body. I've had people say, well, will I be raised up an old person or a young person or something in between? I imagine you'll be raised and I'll be raised and we'll have a body that is timeless and therefore age won't affect it. Our physical bodies are affected by development, but our spiritual body is an eternal body and probably will have no indication of age whatsoever. But in order to be a spiritual person in heaven after a while, and here's the important point. We want to be like Christ in the resurrected body, right? To do that, you have to be like Christ 
in your spirit. So while the resurrected body and the glorification will be like Jesus Christ, in Romans 8 and verse 23 says, We are eagerly waiting for what? The adoption. The adoption. What's that mean? When we obey the gospel, we have been adopted into the family of God. And being in the family of God, then we are heirs of the promises of God, which includes this resurrected eternal body. Eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. God cares about the body as much as he cares about the spirit. In the sense that he's not going to let it remain in the grave, destroyed, corrupt, and and defeated by sin and death. Rather, he's going to be raised, it's going to be raised up, changed immortal, and death will have been defeated. So, we're going to be adopted one in, well, we're going to be redeemed in our body, but to do that, you have to be adopted in the family of God. So, God cares for our bodies as well, and we should too. The Bible tells us that our body is receptacle of the Holy Spirit which is in us, which we have of God, and we are not our own. It says, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, because you've been bought with a price. So sometimes we think, well, this old body, doesn't, God doesn't care anything about it. Well, that's not true. If God didn't care anything about it, why bother with any resurrection? Just let the spirit go back to heaven and forget about the body, because what use is it? But in God's plan, something about that body being redeemed and saved and glorified is important to God. Maybe we don't understand that now. I know I don't. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, 35 again, someone will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Well, the living and the dead will both undergo a change. We're not transposing or changing from one body to the next, but changing the body we have to the spiritual eternal body. The living will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the trumpet of God, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Two different processes, but coming up with the same conclusion. Because in verse 53 of 1 Corinthians 15, he said, This mortal must put on immortality. Our spirit is not mortal. Our spirit is eternal. So the mortal is our body. Our decayed body must put on an undecayed state. And so he says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. We've already said the spiritual body is that which is raised up and suited for heavenly dwelling. The natural body is the flesh and blood that Paul says in verse 50 cannot inherit the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom. So our job is to transform our spiritual body, our, excuse me, our inner self, to be obedient to the gospel and faith, trust and living a life according to God's instructions. And then when we die with that kind of faithfulness, God will one day raise us up. And that's the beauty of that. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, We shall not inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption see incorruption. You inherit the kingdom of God by being born again. And Jesus said that to Nicodemus in John 3. Truly I say unto you, unless you're born again, you cannot enter what? The kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born in, in his old age from his mother's womb? Jesus said, that which is the flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. Truly I say unto you, unless you're born of water, that's baptism, and of the spirit, that's the changed mind, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So our bodies must be changed. Let's go back to Philippians 3.21 again, <clears throat> where he says, He will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. How? According to the working by which he is able also to subdue all things to himself. In other words, we don't know. Take a grain of corn and you dig into that thing and show me the, the germ of life in that corn. Scientists can't find it. God put it there. How do you do it? I don't know. DNA... Can you make DNA? We just in recent years discovered that we have DNA. It's very important. It's it's a ton of information contained in very small pieces, invisible to the naked eye, but still there. We can discover it. We can analyze it. We can talk about what it takes to have this quality or that quality, but go home and try to make one. 
Make a string of DNA and see if you can. We don't understand that. That's something God does. Now, if you can understand those things, then maybe you can understand how God changes a physical body to a spiritual body. But obviously, that's been left for Him. And as 1 John 3, 2 says, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So we're going to have our bodies changed to be like His glorious body. We'll be like Him because we'll see Him then as He is. And the change will be instantaneous. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 2. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. And there's that beautiful term for dead saints. They're sleeping Jesus. You never see the Bible called a disobedient or wicked man asleep when he's dead. Only God's people are asleep. So that tells me that they're sleeping and therefore there's the hope of being awakened to a glorious awakening. It says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see two different states there. The dead will be raised incorruptible, that's one process. And the living, who are not dead, will be changed. But both will be incorruptible at that point in time. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And then, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 2 and 4, we will then be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And this is important because when sin was introduced into the world, death, suffering, misery, rebellion, wickedness all came with it. And it's important to God to undo all the damage that was done by sin and by Satan and by the evil of this world. So that when we talk about the resurrection of the body, we're really talking about the ultimate victory of God over every one of its enemies. And Paul discusses that in 1 Corinthians 15 as well. He said in verse 25, He must reign till he has put his enemies under his feet. What enemies? All his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And so that's what's important to God, to give us that victory over death. So when we come to the end of the chapter, and he says in verse 53, The corruptible must put on incorruption, and the mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Then he quotes the psalm, O death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? You know what's so painful about losing a loved one? It's permanent, so far as this life is concerned. You know, it's a painful thing, but if they were to die for a week or two, we'd say, well, I didn't want to see them that much anyway, and when they come back, then we'll visit some. But when a loved one dies, you know this side of eternity, you never see them again, you never get to talk to them again. You wish you could hear their voice. You wish you could see their form. And that's what sinks in when you lose someone very close to you, and it really hurts deep down inside, doesn't it? And that's what God says, I'm going to take care of that, and everything that that does to you is going to be undone. You're going to be rejoicing and glorious because of the resurrection. And the songs that Kai led tonight are perfect because it talks about the morning of joy when we all shall be resurrected with our loved, faithful ones in Christ And have a great reunion as we go toward heaven. I look forward to that day. Verse 54, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 57, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's the so what of this. He tells us, I don't have to make it for you. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the Lord. Where else would you go? In this life, there's nothing but sin, sorrow, suffering, death. Even the pleasures of sin are temporary. But if we'll trust in God, by faith look to Him, and in the worst moments of our life believe with all of our heart that this chapter is true and what He says about the resurrection is real, then nothing this life throws at us will matter. That's why Jesus said to the twelve, Do not fear those who can destroy the body, and after that they have nothing more they can do. But rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. 
Yes, I say to you, fear him. So if we die outside of Jesus, if we have not been born again so that we can enter the kingdom of heaven, then the resurrection will be left behind. The glorious ones will be resurrected and ascend with Jesus into heaven to be with him forevermore, 1 Thessalonians 4. And the rest will be left behind to meet Jesus in flaming fire when he takes vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. All humanity will know which choice they would prefer when that day comes. The real question is, are you going to make the price worthwhile now that you can go to heaven? Are you prepared for the great event that we call the resurrection? And do you understand what the Bible says and means by that? Remember, we reap what we sow. Don't be deceived, Paul said in Galatians chapter 6. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He who sows to the flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. In other words, if you live for the here and now, when you die, you've had all the reward you're ever going to get. Every good thing you've ever enjoyed is here and gone, and that's it. But it says, he who sows to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap what? Everlasting life. You know, we're all wearing masks by order. And we're all being of our best to avoid the, the virus. And then we read on the news, well, maybe another strain's coming from Great Britain and it's going to be stronger, more dangerous than the previous one. And as I listen to that, all I think about is this. There's no guarantees in life, are there? Nope. You can do everything you can to protect yourself. And guess what? One day you're going to die from something. So you can't avoid that. Exercise all you want, take all the vitamins, lose all the weight or gain all the weight as the case may be. Do everything you can to live as long as you can, but you'll still die. And so there's no hope in that. The only hope is that if I'm not right with the Lord, if I were to die tonight, then I'm going to lose my soul eternally. But you and I have the power to do something about it because God has brought salvation within our grasp. And it's our choice our will that says, I believe in Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. His blood will wash away my guilt. I will no longer be separated from God. And I'll be a child of God in the family of God. And one day I will be redeemed and my body will be redeemed. And it will be in heaven after a while with all the other righteous saints. We all know that eternity is worth it. The real question is, do we have what it takes to be faithful steadfast, immovable, and abound in the work of the Lord here and now. If you need to respond to the gospel, then now's the time to do it because you will reap what you sow. If you want eternal life, you've got to reap to the Spirit. You've got to sacrifice some things here for the blessed reward. And if you want to enjoy this life only, then that's all you're going to get. Eat, drink, and be merry, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, because tomorrow you die. I'm not doing that, and I hope you won't either. Obey Jesus while we stand and sing.